It's always good to be back here, one of my favorite places. Hunt and I were talking when we were coming in. We remember when this was the real center theater back in the days when you got dressed to come to the movies. Hunt, welcome right. back to Oklahoma City. It's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, Hunt, let's start a little bit with your life in Oklahoma City. Uh, I know your father was a physician. Yes, he was. And for many years you thought you would follow in his footsteps. So yeah. talk about growing up where you went to school, the neighborhoods you grew up in, some of your regular routines. Sure. Everything is in a seven mile radius, so right here. I was born at St. Luke's Hospital. Um, I went to uh, Miss Ray's Playhouse. I went to Edgemere. I went to the Oklahoma Speech and Hearing Clinic where I learned to read. I went to uh, Harding High and Cassidy and then went back east to school. We also had a family farm about 20 minutes, uh, 20 miles from here in Choctaw. And so all my experiences were all right here. Mm -hmm. uh, what were you interested in as a young man growing up, other than girls? Uh, the Sooners. The Sooners. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. and, uh, and we were, we were big hunters, you know, like we used to do in Oklahoma. My dad was a great, great hunter and fisherman, and he passed that you know, down to me. And I've passed that down along to my children. And I even got my wife, she won't hunt, but I got her fishing. So mm -hmm. it did pretty good there. But uh, it, was, it was a very great growing up. You know, we had Little League Baseball, and they got into wrestling in seventh grade, which was my, my passion. Uh, I'm dyslexic, and so uh, throwing a ball to a dyslexic is a very hard thing. But with wrestling, you could just grab onto it and not let go. Mm -hmm. So it was a, that was a huge passion for me. And I, I was really told people until I was about 10 years old, that's what I was going to do, it was to be governor because my mother's father, Judge Albert C. Hunt, was a, a judge here in Oklahoma City. He was a Supreme Court judge for actually two terms, which was very rare at the time. And then about 13, 14, um, I would go on house calls. My dad actually did house calls, if you can still believe that. And uh, he had a big practice, because you know, Oklahoma was so spread out. You know, so he had patients all over the place. And he had a lot of, being an eye doctor, a lot of industrial patients. So they were always getting you know, stuff in their eyes and things like that. And that fascinated me, you know, 13, 14 on. Medicine, 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 medicine. And I uh, worked at St. Anthony's, I worked at University Hospital you know, in the summer. I studied pre-med at, at Rollins College and, uh, and Wake Forest University, North Carolina. And then my brother Dick, at one Christmas, decided, he said, you need to come to LA. He'd been out there for three years and he was a film, uh, film um, student at the American Film Institute, which is a national film school. Still, you know, still there, still going very strong. And he was a directing fellow and he was gonna produce, or excuse me, direct his thesis film, a 30 minute short dramatic, dramatic called The Drought. And he said, you work in the hospital every summer for the last few summers, come out to LA. And so I did, my friend John Thompson, a fellow buddy from Crown Heights, and we uh, jumped in our Toyota and rolled, went all the way to Vegas, all the way to LA, made a little stop in Vegas, mm -hmm. lost our savings for the summer, and then uh, <laughs> headed out to, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> then got to uh, California. And I was taking uh, little chemistry courses out there and some summer school at UCLA, I think a film course. And I mean, you talk about getting struck by something, because uh, I went to, started going to work with Dick in the afternoon. It was the American Film Institute. It was the school, all these young, young kids and all that. And, uh, and they were, it just completely overtook me, the whole thing. You know, like this, the, the makeup test, sitting in script meetings, sitting in, you know, meeting with a, with a cinematographer, like going location scouting. It was just, you know, because it was just this idea that my brother had. He wrote the script, and now it's being realized. And it, uh, I made a phone call to my parents at the end of the summer and said, I don't think I'm going to go back to school. They were thrilled, by the way, to get that phone call. <laughs> <laughs> Every parent would be. But, uh, and they were great. They were understanding. They always have been supported us you know, forever that way. And that was, that was it. I mean, I worked on my brother's film as, a, as, a, as the caterer. Mm -hmm. So when I say I started at the bottom, I started at the bottom. Well, I was going to say <laughs> <that> unpaid. <laughs> a lot of Oklahomans have had their start in a variety of roles. Mary Kay Place was in town a few weeks ago. She started as a secretary with the scriptwriters, sure, sure. Uh, writing television shows. And you started as a cook. Well, I did. You, you had an interest in cooking at the time. I, I did. Believe. I actually was going. I was like cooking so much. I was taking cooking courses, and we really were watching watching my brother's car one day. And I was getting ready to apply to uh, Cordon Bleu, the cooking school. So still working on doing film stuff. I said, it'd be really good to get a year, go to France, get this cooking down. And he said, you know, you can cook for your friends anytime you want. If you make movies, you make them for everybody. And he said, you can go there for, away for a year, but I don't think you're, you're like, we're just kind of starting up. He said, I think you need to stay here and you know, not, not do that. And uh, luckily, about three months later, I got a call to go work on the movie Airplane. 
Mm-hmm. So my brother's always guided me well mm-hmm. <laughs> with the right decisions and what to do. In terms of an assistant uh, producer on a project like Airplane, describe for us some of the duties that you had from, from the beginning when you're developing the script and the casting all the way through the final wrap. Yeah, just a little bit of everything, you know, and, and that one, uh, the producer, actually the producer did a lot, they trained me a lot, a guy named John Davison who was head of uh, physical production for New World. Because actually the first movie I actually worked on and got paid for was Grand Theft Auto, which is being directed by another Oklahoman, Ron Howard. And it was written by Ron and Lance Howard, you know, was Ron's father, and I was a PA on that. It was a great experience and, you know, long, long hours. I was making $75 a week and so happy and so proud and met so many great people. You know, I'm friendly with Ron, you know, to this day. Um, and then um, I did commercials for about a year after that. Great experience, because I mean, each commercial is like a little movie. You've got to cast it, you've got to have a script, you've got to you know, find the locations, get the crew, get, the, you know, get it made, get it edited. And uh, it was right after that I got the call you know, for Airplane. And John just said it's, you know, it was his first movie. We started out as a little independent movie for AIP, but they wanted to have a rewrite, and the boys, as we call them, David Zucker and Jerry Zucker and Jim Abrams, who I've done four films with you know, over the years, um, they were, so we're not going to change the script. And so it went to what's called Turnaround. It was kind of in, in limbo. And a few months later, it landed up at, at, Warner, excuse me, at Paramount with Howard W. Koch, you know, who was a very esteemed producer at the time and always was. And so, and he kind of mentored both of us on that project. And again, it was literally like arranging dance lessons for Julie Haggerty and Bob Hayes you know, to finding the, you know, working the, all, all the stuff with TWA I was put in charge of. Because TWA was the airline that we did our whole big tie-in with. And it was just whatever need, whatever what Hooter does is, whatever needs to get done, either you get it done or you find somebody you can get it done, mm-hmm. you know. And you do, you, it's, a, it's a big extended family. It can be a dysfunctional family, but it's a big, <laughs> it's a mm-hmm. big family that, uh, you know, goes in a lot of different directions and has, solves a lot of problems together. And all of that was shot in the studios there? Yeah, yeah we shot it all at Culver City Studio. Um, uh, it was a Paramount picture, but it didn't have any sound. They were, they were full of sound stages, so we went to Culver City Studio. And Culver City had the mock-ups, so we had the, the, the jet plane mock-ups there. And then we shot for about six or seven days at the, at the uh, airport. Can we, can we get that mic a little bit better? Sure. Let me get closer. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. Is mine okay, Lance? Yes. No. No. Can't hear. Well, you're in the front row, so we got a we have a problem here. <laughs> All right. We will speak up. Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, from beginning, when you were first hired as an assistant producer, would it have taken a year in production until? I, I was on an airplane about a year between between the prepping of it, between the prepping of it, the shooting, and the editing. It was a year. Um, in standard rule of thumb. Is on an average movie is about uh, you know 10 to 12 week prep, 10 to 12 week shoot, and about 24 to 28 weeks in post. Now that can vary. You know when I did Revenge, you know at Sony, I was on that for two years. You know we had some, some delays and this and that. If you're in a big science fiction film, you can spend you know two years on the on the visual effects alone. So uh, the general rule of thumb to prep it, shoot it, and edit it. Once it's been green lit, that can take 10 years <laughs> to get uh, to get it green lit. Um, but a year's about a, a good general of them. Mm-hmm. Now you mentioned Ron Howard, of course. He was born in Duncan. Uh, Rance is from Kay County, uh, the grandson of, of people who made the land run of 1893. He really sees his Oklahoma roots. Uh, Ron, of course, left as a child, not so much, but you work with others such as Wes Duty, who will join us in a, in a few minutes, and others. Talk about some of the Oklahomans that you met when you first moved to L.A. and starting your career and some of those Oklahoma connections that helped you? They, they were good. I mean, I got, I got to the, 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 the last year's previous winner, Gray Fredrickson. Probably met him the first five years I was there. Gray even gave us, I was the only script I, I wrote, I wrote a, a friend of mine, and Gray gave us a, a, an office at Zoetrope. They were just finishing up, um, uh, was it, uh, one of the big Zoetrope movies, Hammett was being shot there. And so um, he, Gray gave us a free office for the two of us to write this script. And so, uh, and there's, there's a lot more Okies out there than you think. I mean, Doug Claiborne is a producer. He produced a movie uh, for, for us when I was running Gaylord Films. My, uh, Mark Radcliffe, who was Chris Columbus's uh, producer, produced a couple of the Harry Potters. Um, Clu Gulliger, the, the, the great, great guy, great Oklahoma actor. He, talk about doing a favor for a bunch of Okies, he was in my brother's AFI movie. And of course, it's a student film, and so everyone works for free. And we thought we were going to shoot in about three weeks, but it 
a little slower than that. That can happen. Mm -hmm. It took us about five weeks to shoot it. And Kluge just stayed with us. So we had this big act. It was so great for my brother's career, for all of us. It's just for a bunch of young filmmakers to have this total pro, you know, like Clue Gulliger out there on the set. It was wonderful. I worked with G.D. Spradling, who uh, you know, started out at the Mummers Theater here. He was in uh, Dream West, you know, many series that, that we did. Worked with West Studi, of course. And before I worked with West Studi, uh, I think it was Wes's first movie that he did, uh, my sister Junie. The, the most famous member of the Lowry family, uh, the casting director, she cast Wes in the movie uh, Pow Wow Highway. So we like our Oklahoma Mafia. We like it a lot. We have lots of interns. And uh, I've spoken at uh, Oklahoma with Andy Horton, who runs the film program there. And we have at least one or two interns in my office right now as we speak in, in L.A. So uh, we like the Oklahoma connection. Well, of course, the two Oklahomans closest to you would be your brother and sister. Dick, who was there first, and then your sister. Talk a little bit about their careers, and then your sister following you to Hollywood. Sure, no, it, it's the best thing in the world. We all live in one, uh, with one mile of each other. Um, Dick's kids are a little bit older, so they babysitted my kids and Judy and Bill's kids. They're all about the same age, the four of them. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, a friend once told us, told uh, Patsy, my sister, and I said, you Lowry's have kind of turned L.A. into a small town. You know, people were just all, all right there. We do all this, all, a, lot, a lot of Sunday night dinners and all that kind of stuff together. But besides having family, which is so wonderful, when you're in a you know, big city, you know, you don't know, we didn't know anybody, but I, I knew Dick when I went out there. But it was, uh, it's just great. He being a director, being the perfect older brother that he was, he has mentored my career forever. He really has. He's, he's given me advice on every step of the way. And, and, it, and like all careers, they go this way and that way and take left turns. And, uh, and he was all, you know, just got someone you can always just rely on. And the same with Junie. We just, we literally, we, we've gotten better about it, but still, after being out there, I, we, I moved out in 76, my brother in 73, and Junie came out in 78. And we get, we get together a lot, I mean, more than once a week. And the first thing is, how the family, how's this, how's it, how's your dog, you know, how's, what, what's going on, how's the garden? And they just, boom, start talking movies. You know, and just talking about what, we, what, you know, what we've been doing, what we've been going. And Dick traveled so much because he was really he did a lot of long form TV. He's kind of the king of it. He did the, you know, the Kenny Rogers Gambler series. He did a lot of miniseries, a lot of TV movies, and um, he was just just constant energy. And then my sister, who I'm, I can brag a little bit, I, I couldn't be proud of her. She has won eight Emmys, and she has been nominated for 44 Emmys. So I don't, I, don't, I don't know how many people nominate for 44 Emmys, but it's pretty, uh, and mostly I get phone calls from friends and family and people I don't even know saying, uh, hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. Uh, can you get me in to see Junie? Can you get my friend in to see Junie? You know, that's, uh, I can sell tickets to that. <laughs> but, uh, what makes her so good at her job? She's, uh, she's got a fabulous personality, which is one thing, but she, she just, she's very talented. She can spot that talent. Talent loves her. You work very hard. She goes to you know, equity waiver plays, she, she watches stuff, she goes to workshops, she puts workshops on, you know, it's her job to, you know, bring in these actors. It's one thing when you're casting Brad Pitt, well, okay, we know Brad Pitt is, the other guy, Oklahoma, <laughs> on that, but, uh, you know, it's those, it's the smaller roles, it's the people about, about to break, you know, it, it's the people, she, she's very good at finding people, you know, overseas, um, you know, to be in stuff, I mean, or, or casting her movies just have that, you know, six feet, six feet under, Deadwood, True Blood, um, they just all that they just, they just ugly. They're also different. Nurse Betty, she really she works at art, and she also, which is key for it is a collaborative art. There's no doubt about it. You know, if you want to be a fine artist and control your destiny, then write a song or paint a painting. But if you're going to be in the movie business, you're you're not doing it alone. And she has a great group of people around her. Mm -hmm. You know, the key to producing is get a great people. You know, get, you know, get a great people a group around you, and you know, stay out of the way. Work with them, but <laughs> also don't get in the way. Mm -hmm. Well, before we go back to uh, Last of the Mohicans in a few minutes, what are you working on now? Right now, working on uh, several things. I did the movie Time to Kill, you know, the, the John Grisham book uh, many years ago. And so we've uh, taken a book that he wrote about 10 years ago called The Testament. And it's about a lawyer who has to go down to Brazil and find a, uh, the illegitimate daughter of a billionaire and let her know that all the money's been left to her. And it's an action adventure a lot of um, star-crossed, you know, uh, people in love, and it's uh, it, it's fun. It's very, it's very, um, it's a little bit African Queen, you know, meets the Belgian Congo or something mm -hmm. like that. But it's a neat, uh, it's it's a neat. Uh, it's, it's not your typical Grisham book because it doesn't take place in a courtroom. It takes place in the Panatol of Brazil, you know, which is the, the the biggest area of of you know water in the world, and it's uh, dealing with the, the indigenous tribes and 
how they're being manipulated and changed. It deals with a lot of different issues. But in the, in the true heart of it, it's a love story between these, this missionary doctor and this kind of cynical lawyer. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it, took, it took us 10 years. And, and John's a friend of mine, <laughs> a good friend. It took us 10 years to get the, uh, to get the rights to that. So that's, that's exciting. Who's going to be in the movie and where will you do the uh, location shoots? We'll, we'll, we'll go to Brazil for part of it. We're also doing some pre-scouting right now. We're, we're, we're just in the process of uh, in trying to choose a director put a director on it and then from there we'll you know, grow it from the cast and everything else. But it'll definitely be shot part of, part of it in the Panatol of Brazil. So we'll all go get a bunch of shots and uh, you know, a moving army, go down there <laughs> and then shoot. And then we'll shoot a part of it in uh, Washington, D.C. As a producer, did you coordinate working with Mr. Grisham and the, the screenwriters? Oh sure, we, we picked the screen. I'm actually producing that with Mark Johnson, who's a good friend of mine. You know, Mark's a, a great producer. And together we were we've been bugging John to and, and David his agent you know, to get this for us, and we picked the the writer you know, Jamie Linden, and now we're picking the director. You got to start with the written word, mm -hmm. and uh, that, that's what's fun. You're, you're involved with with all the different elements that are necessary to make it happen. So some more than others, but it's a, it's just fun because you get to kind of play make believe with all these creative people. Yeah, and I'm the orchestra director with all those parts. And that's it. I can't play any of them, but I can, <laughs> I can help <laughs> in a sense. Have you ever acted in any of your movies? Uh, I was hoping you were going to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did a movie, which you should probably try to find it on uh, somehow. Uh, that, that Humanoid from the Deep was the first movie that I produced by myself. I did Airplane you know, with John Davison as the associate producer, and then I got a call from Roger Corman. Actually, Roger Corman called John and said, I'm shooting this movie in seven weeks up in Mendocino. It's about these monsters who come out of the water and wreak havoc on this fishing town, and I need a producer. And John said, he's sitting, sitting across the desk from me. And so literally, he said, I was out of an hour, and immediately, Roger likes to go fast. He didn't mess around, Roger Corman. Incredible, incredible guy. And uh, I was meeting with Roger within an hour. He called me back an hour later and said, you're doing that movie. I met the director the next day, and two days later we were scouting up in Mendocino. So, and I, I acted in that. The actor didn't, in, in, in my defense, <laughs> the, act, the actor didn't show up. So as a producer, you know, you have to, you know, fill the void. And so I play, uh, and I play a fisherman, something I do know something about, and I get blown up. Which you is, were a victim. But, yeah, which okay. is good for the, for the movie and for the acting. So I got killed. <laughs> yeah, very easy. But, uh, so if there was a sequel, you were not coming back. I wouldn't be invited fisherman. back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, well, that, that was it for the acting. So. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, now let's talk about Last of the Mohicans. Uh, before we bring Wes out, what was your first connection with that movie? First time you heard about it? I was, uh, was finishing up the movie uh, Only Lonely at Fox, the, the Chris Columbus uh, directed with John Candy and Maureen O'Hara. Shot in Chicago, had a great time. A bunch of my friends came to visit me there. And my wife and I had just gotten married. And um, I'd heard about the script. It was, kind of, it was the talked about script on the lot. Everybody was just, this is it, it's cool, it's amazing. Uh, Michael Mann, who's, you know, again, talking about a visionary and a lot of talent. And it, it, we, we knew about it in Chicago. And it was just, it was, it was a big deal. And then now I'm back in LA and we're, we're mixing the movie. We're in the mixing stage, we're bringing all the sound together and everything. And an executive from Fox walked in and said, I've got a script for you. And I said, well, what is it? He said, it's Last Little Higgins. He said, oh my gosh, I'll let you. No, really? Is that, is, do you need someone? I said, yeah, we do. I said, you know, I'm supposed to do Home Alone 2 with Chris Columbus, because Chris had just done Home Alone, the first one. It was obviously a massive hit. And I said, I told Chris I would do Home Alone 2 with him in New York. I was thinking, New York for a few months, Home Alone 2, it'll be a big hit, it'll be fun. He goes, well, just read this. The studio would really like it if you'd go meet with Michael. We've told him about you. And just read it. And so I came home. My wife was in the other room, and I said, she, what's that? I said, last, oh, last moment, I heard it. That's, that's, that, that's that hot script at Fox. I said, yeah. And he said, what are you doing with it? Said, we're, going to, we're going to New York. We've got, you told Chris. I said, I know, I know. But they want me to read it in the studio. You've got you know, you to placate him a little bit. And I read the first page, which is the elk hunt. You know, and it's you know, about those, the three of them going after that, the, the elk mm -hmm. together. And I shouted to Christine in, in the other room and said, um, I'm doing this movie. And she came and said, you are what? I said, read this first page. And she read it and said, yeah, you're doing this movie. And then Chris was great. I called Chris and he goes, well, that's one of my wife's favorite books. And I went and met Michael and then Daniel Day-Lewis, they were in survival training because Michael wants everything. He didn't, he didn't make it up. It's real. He's, it's studied and his accuracy is to, you know, to the T. It really is. And so I flew down to Alabama and met Michael and Daniel and we all hit it off. 
And that was another thing, little late, and I came back, packed, and two days later I was off to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, were, we shot the whole movie in Western North Carolina. Well, I tell you, I watched that movie many times. I have it at home, we, we watch it, it's one of my favorites. And to me, the dramatic tension in that movie would not have been the same without Wes Studi. There's no question. And before we get him into this story, let's bring out Wes Studi. Yes. Wes, please join us. <laughs> Wes, we now have yeah, warmed up. We <laughs> exactly <laughs> saving the best for last. <laughs> uh, we have Hunt learning about the script, deciding that yes, he wants to do this. What was the first casting call that you heard about that this movie was being made? Uh, my first time was uh, uh, casting offices were on Sunset over by. Uh, uh, close to where it becomes Beverly Hills. Yeah, Doheny, right, right in there. Uh, yeah. Around the Doheny yeah. area, yeah. I went over there and I, uh, I took a picture of, uh, well actually my, uh, my agent said, uh, no, 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 uh, Michael doesn't want to see anything about uh, Dances with Wolves or anything like that, you know? Uh, so don't bother with uh, taking pictures from that or anything over there, you know? But I, I snuck one in there, a smaller one, you know, eight by 10, not, well, yeah. Small? Uh, small? <laughs> small. <laughs> small. <laughs> and I went in and I just sort of left it laying around here at different desks and stuff just to see, just so that they wouldn't forget my face more or less, you know, having once been in there. I, I had one more, uh, a second, a call back. I had one call back and then after that I think uh, they made a deal. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that we brought out in in previous interviews when we've had you back in Oklahoma, but the fact that you grew in a traditional Cherokee family, no fire holla, did not speak English until you went off to school. Having that native language skill helped you in, in several of your movies, but it seemed so natural in Last of the Mohicans. Were you asked at any of the auditions to, to speak in the, you know, from the script? What was the process of the audition itself? You know, I think what I really did were just uh, the, the English lines. Uh, at that point, I don't think they had any, uh, 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 any of the uh, uh, indigenous languages uh, in there uh, at translated at that point in time. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, most of my stuff was done in English. But uh, uh, you're right about that, Bob. But the fact that, now I could be just, you know, I, I could be just kidding myself when I say that. I think that the fact that I do speak a language other than English kind of helps me out in terms of uh, using phonetics from other languages uh, simply because my tongue is just a little, is more ready to make sounds other than the kind you make in English, right? It's, uh, and I suppose, I, but I know I sound, I sound uh, you know, I have an accent of, one kind or another in any of these languages because they used French in, in uh, Last of the Modes as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's been a, a great uh, uh, help to me to be able to uh, kind of jump into any kind of phonetic languages that, uh, uh, and the fact that I speak Cherokee as a first language was a, a great help to me. But, uh, next. <laughs> uh -huh. Were, did you know Wes at the time that you started assembling a cast? Had you seen him in a movie? What was your, your how did your friendship develop? I mentioned to Junie that, 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 mm -hmm. that Michael was all very excited about Wes Studi and he's going to you know, cast him as Magua. And then yeah, my sister you know, met um, Wes on Pow Wow Highway, you know, which he did. And Junie just got so excited. So I, 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 I had not seen Pow Wow Highway at, at the time. I saw it afterwards. <laughs> but, uh, and she said, oh, you're, you're going to love Wes, and he's going to, she read the script, and she said, he, he's going to tear it up. He's going to tear it up. And, uh, and, and, and he did. We, we were kind of an, an all of Wes on the movie. We really, we had great, we had Daniel A. Lewis, we had amazing people in that movie, and a lot of great English actors, and Madeline Stowe, and, uh, but, but I mean, Wes was just that seething from within, a, a man who'd been damaged, a man who'd been hurt, 
the man had had his wife and children, you know, taken away, killed, you know, from him and all that. And uh, obviously he wanted revenge, but, but he wanted revenge also for purity. He wanted to, to right a wrong. And, uh, and he just, I like always to tell the story that his, his first scene we shot was, it's when they're all in the, one of the few interior scenes in the whole movie where they're, the scout's gonna take you know, these guys, you know, to go meet up with Cora Monroe and all that. And of course, they're ambushed on the road. And West just, they say, you, who's your scout? You scout. And West just comes out of the shadows and says, Magua. And I'm doing it. Horrible version. You're so much better. Towards <laughs> 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 my acting is bad. <laughs> but, uh, you don't know, but I, I, you know, I, I based my entire performance on what I saw. You I, I figured that. Exactly. <laughs> 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 it was those dinners we had at the house. Yeah, I took those lobster. <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. He was standing over in the corner in Michael Mann's office, and uh, and uh, Michael turned around and said, "This is Hunt. Is that right?" He walked. He stepped up and said, "Hunt." <laughs> <laughs> so producers do we help any way we can. That's what we did. <laughs> but you know, I, there's there's you know you get asked questions uh, that uh, you kind of they implant in your mind. Uh, and one I've been asked over and over and over again is one I want to ask Hunt, if you don't mind, yeah. Bob. Uh, which is your favorite film that you've ever made? <laughs> well, they're like my children. I love them all. Is, is my standard <laughs> standard thing. But I, I think everyone knows. And I am. You know, you're always proud of some movies more than others, and some movies turn out better than others. And, and that's what's. You know, what makes it all so interesting and challenging. But Last Little Higgins is my favorite movie. There's no, I mean, they, 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 they just from a great book, you know, it was an extremely hard movie to make. We, talk, we were never on level ground. And we were always like this, because we were shooting this thing in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And so it was, it was arduous. It was the rainiest time in Western North Carolina in over 100 years. But just going to work each day, and we were working about 18 hour days on average. 18 hour yeah, days? it was, for, but they were just, seeing, you know, because we were really recreating history in, in such a in such a wonderful way. And, and it just, it wasn't much my favorite movie, when my first thing Michael asked me about the movie when uh, we were talking in Alabama, and he said, well, what do you think of this movie is? And I said, Michael, I said, well, it's obviously, it's a, he said to me, it's a love, I said, what do you think of this, Michael? He said, it's a love story in a, in a war-torn environment. I said, absolutely. And he said, how do you see the period? What do you think, what do you think how do you envision it? I said, Michael, for the audience and for me, it might as well be a science fiction movie. No one knows what people were wearing, what their tattoos were like, what their hair was like, the way they spoke, the way they moved in 1757. I mean, there had been Civil War movies, there had been other, you know, there had been you know, different movies, but when you go back and think how many movies were made in 1757 of the French and Indian War, and you've had all these different Indian, uh, which is nice too, because every movie you always saw was of just the Indians. You know, it's been that way forever. And Michael, really, I mean, you know, we had the Huron, we had the Abenakis, we, we had all the Eastern tribes, we had, yeah. the, we had the Mohawks. I mean, it was just out, and they all dressed, they talked differently, obviously, but their, their, their culture was, you know, they, they were, these were different cultures, you know, living. And, and he just, he captured that so well, it was like everything was new. You know, we, we made all the wardrobe. None of the wardrobe, well, you couldn't go to a wardrobe house. To this day, you can't go to a wardrobe house. Like, I need to start from 1757. You can do World War I, World War II, and some more, like I mentioned, other things like that, some Western stuff, obviously. But we, 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 we flew in people from all over the world, the researchers. We, I mean, we, we must have had at one time a dozen different researchers, you know, on the, and, and, and boy, Michael utilized all of them. And that, that's why it's my favorite movie. It was such a task. The performances were amazing. And uh, it's chilling. It's just a, it's a very involving movie. When it's over, everyone just kind of, we went to a million screenings for people just, they, 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 they wait, they're quiet. I think they're relieved, mm. and they clap a little bit, and it, just, it really takes them in. You know, that, that, it's a very involving movie. Mm. So. Wes, in, in making the movie, was there one particular scene when you were actually doing the shoot where you were back in time and you had that feeling of sense of place and history and dramatic tension? Did any particular scene come back to you? I think many times uh, that, that happened to me uh, or I became involved in that way. Um, and the first part, first instance that I can think of is the actual uh, beginning of the massacre. You know, the, the massacre, that Massacre Valley. Um, and we had, uh, we were up, we were walking through the uh, forest on the side of a hill, just out, just a little out of reach from the uh, columns moving through the middle of the, the, the valley there. Uh, and. Uh, 
the thing about the whole thing was that all of the reenactors, uh, you know, there were the Indian guys and then there were the soldiers. And there was a, a real feeling of, of uh, animosity, yeah. if you will. I mean, a We're gonna real, get it, all. it was <laughs> real. I mean, it a was. lot of these guys, they had worked together in other scenes before and perhaps even had some clashes or whatever, you know, throughout uh, the making of the film. But finally, when this Massacre Valley showed up, all of these, all of these Indian guys are kind of on, uh, on the hillside with me. Oh man, they're pumped up, man. I mean, they're ready to get out there and do it. Let's do it for real. You know, and then these, <laughs> and these, and these soldiers were out there in the middle, boy, it's true. There was a tension. You were there. there. there you could feel it. Yeah. I mean, the hair on the back of my neck just began to stand up. It was whew, emotional. Yeah. So I, uh, my yell, my shout was the one that started the whole thing. And once that shout happened, all of the all that movement came into into toward that column of soldiers and people started. There were real fights going on out there. In that yeah. valley. I mean, <laughs> nobody got hurt. <laughs> nobody got hurt. Nobody got hurt. But uh, it was a, an Im yeah. immensely. And each time, because obviously you do this. Again, we we train for this. We just, you don't yeah. just go out there and, and 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 just do Massacre Valley. It took us over a week to shoot it. We probably trained for a month to have everybody <laughs> ready. And. Uh, and all the all the the hand to hand combat and everything was doing that was all research and that's the way they fought you know back back then you fired one time you know you had one bullet and then yeah. the, the, if you didn't kill them that way you killed them by seeing the whites of their eyes and it was uh, each time we would do it and it, it kind of get pumped up more and more oh, <laughs> on God, the takes yeah, it was yeah, uh, it was yeah it was uh, something days, else it was really yeah. an exciting time uh, but I'd like to say that I think we visited every ridge top in the. Uh, Great Smoky Mountains there. Yeah, yeah I think we did. Uh, and, and we left parts because we had to build roads. Huh? Yeah, oh, we did. We, we, to, it was, we had to build roads to uh, some of the places we, because we couldn't we take build the roads back roads. behind because we couldn't spoil we could, everybody. Because else. we couldn't use the reg, regular roads right. there because we would have worn, worn them out with all the big trucks yeah. and equipment and everything. But they would actually uh, uh, build roads back behind through the uh, back ways into the, up to that uh, waterfall. Oh yeah, that, right. Grandfather Mountain. Oh yeah. my God! And then I uh, I twisted my leg. Remember that? Oh yeah. I twisted my leg. I had to go down to uh, Charlotte. Right. Uh, the sports medicine capital of the world, and uh, they uh, I uh, tore my uh, ligament in one under my kneecap, uh, and they shipped me down there very quickly, uh, and. Uh, did orthoscopic surgery on it, just cut the thing out and then sent me back up. And actually there's a shot. I don't know if uh, anyone's ever noticed, but there's a shot where I am killing Eric on that rock. And my right leg, you can see about this much of the cast yeah, that I right. had on. <laughs> <laughs> but it's real quick, yeah. a real quick turn. But, and they, because I had, my leg was kind of, was that way I couldn't walk around up in the, on those rocks, and uh, they fashioned uh, they fashioned a uh, uh, a chair with handles in the front. Very the Cleopatra like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> These guys were carrying me around in this. <laughs> you look good in that chair. <laughs> huh. oh, um, the only thing that made me kind of nervous one day was that I noticed uh, uh, my uh, guys that carried me over there at the far end of the corner, and I, they go, I don't know what they were up to. <laughs> <laughs> the falls were 2,000 feet. They, they had kind of, <laughs> but they had kind of glassy eyes. Right. Like, and here I am, we're like this, walking on yeah. ledges like this, and I'm in this chair, just huddled in there. <laughs> it's a good thing I had painkillers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that was yeah. a remarkable part and a great movie. We have about five minutes for a few questions from the audience. Anyone have a question you're dying to ask? Uh, anyone? I have one. Yes. So we have a lot of high school students <coughs> here today. And uh, what would you recommend if someone's graduating from high school and wants to get into movies, what's the best way to do it? Well, I'd study pre-med. <laughs> I'd, I'd drop out of school. <laughs> I'd go visit my brother. I would uh, obviously go to college and um, 
Take film classes if you want, be a film major. I think if you're gonna be a film director, you should definitely be a film major because you can, you can do it, you get to direct. You do a thesis film and all that. If you wanna be a producer or a writer, whatever you wanna be, you should major or at least minor in English. Because it's all based on the written word. Writers own the town, they should own the town. Um, they, if you can write, if you can't write, that's fine. But if you major in English, you can work with writers. I can't write. Like I told you, I can't do anything. But I can, I can work with writers. I can work with actors. I can you know, work with, with, the, with the crew and stuff like that. And work, my, one of my favorite things is, is working with the writers. You know, they've written a script, and you give notes, and okay, you have a round table. And, it's, you know, and, and they like some of your ideas. They hate some of your ideas, and, and you, you work it out. But film, there's a lot of great film course class, classes out there, a lot of great film universities. You don't have to major in film. You know, to be obviously to, to you know to, to get in the movie business, but I think it's very important to take uh, lots and lots of English classes and and intern do stuff. I mean, they shoot everywhere now. We have lots of summer interns um, all the time. Like we have they have interns that are creative executives and vice presidents that have gone on and left us. And you have to go to Hollywood. You, you can go to Hollywood. There's tons of intern programships there, but there's stuff here. Work on your student films. Work on what's going locally. Work on commercials. But, you know, immerse yourself and go see lots of movies. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. That's the story I tell everyone. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I'll also add to that, because when, when you do a movie acting, you know, that's some of your best work ends up on the floor or, or some of the books on the floor. I don't think there was a scene or a line that, and this is extremely rare for, for any movie or any actor, I don't think there was a scene or a line in the entire movie that was ever cut out of Wes's. It was, it was 100%. And you, you can go and, and and have an actor who has 30 minutes to say screen time in the rough cut, and by the time you're to your final version, they've got four, you know, or they're, or they're up. But um, Wes was a presence that we like to take a lot of advantage of, and, and we did in that movie. Well, to me, that was the pivot point for that dramatic tension that every movie needs, and I'm wondering if Michael Mann knew that before you started shooting. Um, I think he did. I mean, he had a very excellent vision from day one on that movie. Great filmmaker. Any other? Yes. I grew up in those mountains, and I didn't know that they were being filmed there, but uh, recognized so many places that I've spent time. Tell me a little bit about Asheville and being in the Asheville area and how you were treated. You were there quite a while. We were there a very long time, and, and actually, we, we, we went. We had some weather problems, and, and we, we we pretty much finished on schedule. We were a little, we were a little bit over schedule. And, and also, the, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's a huge tourism community, obviously, there. And it's gorgeous. I mean, Asheville, the, the Natchez Trace, the Blue Ridge Parkway, just invigorating, you know, driving to work, you know, every day. But we were getting into the, um, the, the fall foliage season, which is when they make you know, people come from all over the world to watch these. Uh, you guys are too young to want to see a fall foliage, but uh, <laughs> a lot of people do. <laughs> they like to do that. And, uh, and at the, at the end, they wanted us out of there. <laughs> they, they, they liked us, they, they was, uh, but it was definitely, it's, it's, you guys gotta go. <laughs> you gotta fill these hotel rooms with the, uh, but they cooperated, they had to. We, we only shot the movie in a 60 mile radius of Asheville. It was not uncommon for us to drive, you know, 30, 40 minutes to the set. And the whole fort was shot up there you know, on, on Lake, Lake Thompson, which was, we actually stayed up there for about a month. And that was about an hour and 10 minutes outside of Asheville. But they, they, they treated us well. I'm sorry we've got to draw this to a conclusion, but these are two very generous Oklahomans. They helped us with an exhibit at the Oklahoma History Center called Uncle at the Movies. I would like to present each of them with a book that was edited by Larry O'Dell and our staff. Uh, I know Wes has been there already, uh, came for the opening. Uh, Hunt will see it tomorrow, but encourage you to see the exhibits on both of these creative Oklahomans, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hunt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.